This episode contains discussion of graphic sexual violence. Listener discretion is advised. When I was a kid, I don't think I knew anyone who had an actual security system in their home. It just wasn't heard of. I'm sure they existed, but really, for most typical middle-class families, you just didn't think a lot about someone breaking into your home. And we certainly never had the concept of a home invasion. You know, someone coming right through the front door while you're home and awake with plans of theft or even violence. But these days, if there's a knock on the door, everyone is suddenly on high alert. Who's at the door? In our house, we have the doorbell camera, and we also have cameras all around the house, because answering the door, literally opening the door to your house to a stranger, can be a really dangerous thing to do. Annie knows this. As a young woman, she was home alone in her new place, and she heard someone knocking. She opened the door and immediately regretted it. Real people in unreal situations. There is a girl hanging by her broken leg from the telephone wire. And I called 911 and I said, I found a baby. I turned around. I see a gun pointed at me close enough I could touch it. She would hold our heads underwater all the time. He levels the gun, pulls the trigger, and I go down. Her eyes were full of tears. She didn't want to leave us. My hair catches on fire. I swear to God, this is this image is burning my head for the rest of my life. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? When this happened, you were working as an actor in a children's theater company. Was that was that your plan for a career at that time? Yes and no. I think my plan at that time was simply to work as an actor anywhere that would have me. That was a particularly fortuitous meeting, though. And I say that because it was what enabled me to get my equity card so that I could join the Actors' Equity Union, which was the big Sage Actors Union. So it was a very well known and very well respected company. But yeah, it was for kids. I had not anticipated that, but it was a, a really interesting gig for a year. <laughs> I'll say. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, it's not it's not like a typical job that you think about. How old were you at this time? Uh, I was twenty three. I had actually worked for a year prior to this year um, as an intern for this company. So I had two years with it, and I was bumped up full company member a couple of months before the attack happened. I understand you met your boyfriend. He was also an actor. He was. We actually played the parents of Abraham Lincoln <laughs> in an outdoor drama in Indiana uh, one summer. And we formed a relationship. And then I moved with him to Louisville, Kentucky when he got a job at this children's theater. And then I was able to get work there the following year. It was a bad relationship, if I'm being honest. It was not an equals relation, a relationship of equals. Um, it was kind of emotionally stunted and, and not rewarding. I imagine for either of us <laughs> by the end there. But I was really young, and it was very difficult for me to see my way through to separating myself from this relationship. It took a lot to get there. But you did eventually. I did eventually, um, and I did it because my mother, bless her heart, went in for uh, emergency heart surgery, and I actually took a few days off of the company, which was an unusual thing, and I flew back to North Carolina where my mother was in the hospital, and I remember walking in the night before her surgery. She looked up at me, didn't even say hello or anything, just looked at me and said, are you leaving? Are you leaving, Matthew? And I opened my mouth and the word yes came out. And and I thought, oh, okay, well, I guess I guess I am. <laughs> but I really had not thought that that was the case until that moment. But then she came through with flying colors. And it, to me, it sort of took on this 
mystical quality of a promise to God. You know, I, my mom came through, okay, she's going to be all right. I have to leave Matthew now. I have to go out on my own. I have to do this. And I knew it was the right thing to do, but it was difficult. Yeah, that is so interesting, though, when you kind of have the self-talk and you give mm-hmm. yourself an answer that you weren't expecting, but then you think, wow, I guess that's the right answer. And it was the right answer, despite what happened. I want to make that clear. It was absolutely the right answer. But yeah, it would took a lot to get me there. So when my mouth opened and the word yes came out, I don't think anybody was as stunned as I was. So you broke up and then you found yourself your own place. I did. And I felt very fortunate. This place was gorgeous. It was built for young professionals and artists. And it was in the downtown area. It was a former factory of some sort, I think, or warehouse. And they had reconfigured it to be uh, a lot of apartments on, on the perimeter of a square courtyard in the middle. And it was close to the theater complex. And other members of that company also stayed there. So it felt like an ideal location for me. So you were kind of, you, were, you had your own place, but you weren't really completely alone because the other actors lived in the same complex. Exactly. And a couple of members of the administrative staff as well. In fact, the guy to my right was one of the assistant directors. So I felt, you know, I felt very young in a lot of ways. And 23 is very young, especially when you've never been out on your own before. So that was important to me to feel like I had some, like a support network. You know, or at least a few people that I could turn to. Right. But yet still with your independence. Exactly. Let's talk about what happened. This was actually, we need to talk about like a week before it happened. Yeah. You were doing laundry on a Friday afternoon. I was expecting another friend to come down and visit me from Chicago. So of course I did what, you know, what you do, you <laughs> spend the afternoon scrubbing and cleaning and doing laundry. And our laundry was actually a separate room closer to the front of the building. So I had to cross the courtyard to get to and from my apartment. I was sort of near the last load, I think. And I I ran back to my apartment and I thought I closed the door. I'm fairly sure I didn't lock it though. Um, Well, I know I didn't because then I heard it open when I was in the bathroom. And I remember calling out hello and I didn't hear anything. And I talked myself into believing that I hadn't closed the door all the way and the wind had blown it open a little bit. But I, I didn't think much more of it because I was running to get the laundry done. And by the time I came back, I think my friend was pulling up at that moment. So I I didn't have a lot of space or time to think about like what had happened. However, when I came out of my apartment to get that last load, after I'd heard the door, I saw this man across in front of me, several feet away, but I saw him in profile. And I remember it was striking because he was so tall. He was very tall. And he looked like he was wearing the quintessential downtown Louisville waiters uniform, you know, black pants, white shirt, you know, it looked like he had one of those black waiters aprons tied around his waist. I could be wrong. I I might be making that up. But in my head, that's what I associated him with. So I remembered him. When you saw him, were you concerned or suspicious or anything? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I knew that I hadn't seen him before, but that wasn't relevant really because I'd only been there for like a week and a half. So Clearly, I hadn't seen everybody who lived there. And it didn't, it did not strike me as odd at all. Just the, the fact of his height and the way he was dressed, I noted it. That's it. And then that was it. The moment was gone and you know, the night went on. So the next morning, my friend and I were getting ready to leave to go get some breakfast. And I had like an early morning rehearsal. We were rehearsing a Christmas play. Our times were, you know, our call times were kind of strange. And this was an early morning for me. So I walked out, but as I was walking out, there was a woman, actually, she was knocking on my door as I was opening it. And I'd never seen this woman before. She was dressed like she was going out, like she'd been out, like a coat, heavy coat, you know. It didn't look like she was running from one apartment to the next. It looked like she was on her way somewhere. And she handed me my my wallet. And I, I recognized it immediately as my wallet. And I was stunned because I didn't even know my wallet wasn't in my purse. I hadn't had any reason to get into it. And it just didn't occur to me. And she said, is this yours? I found it down here on the ground in the bushes. And she sort of thrust it in my hand and she took off like really quickly before I could ask her anything. And it seemed strange to me. I just couldn't figure out how, like what could have happened? 
And then I thought back to the day before. I don't know if I thought this that day or maybe it was a little bit later, but I, eventually I put it together. When that door opened and I was in the bathroom, this guy was rum- rummaging through my purse. And I had, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, not, not many, well, less than $10 in there. I was still a struggling actor. But it, that money was gone, but nothing else was gone. And I just thought, uh, okay. I thought, well, all right, chalk this up to a city experience for the young kid, right? Always lock your door. Always lock your door, even if you're inside. Always lock your door. And I sort of let it go. I thought, all right, well, you know, no big deal. I did even call the police over it. It just seemed like one of those rites of passage that a young person goes through and hard won experience teaches you not to leave your door unlocked in the future. Right. And even if you did call the police, you don't have any proof. You didn't see anybody take anything or... No, there's nothing I could have done, nothing they could have done. And I was assuming that the man that I saw was the person who took the, the wallet. I didn't even know that. You know, that's, and that's the only piece of information I could have given them. So I just felt like that's it's pointless and I didn't do anything about it. The following Friday was December 7th. I was expecting a friend to come see me and she was one who lived across the courtyard from me, one of the other apartments. I, I made dinner for myself and I was eating. I was watching something on TV. I had this tiny little color set, but it was like from the theater shop department. Basically, my entire apartment was furnished with <laughs> cast off set pieces from the theater shop department, <laughs> like things that they weren't using in the in set design that year. So it wasn't a lot, but you know, it was just enough to make it a little homier. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't know if, if my friend's going to come by or not. So maybe I should just go to bed. And the, there was a knock on the door. It was about nine o'clock at night, I think. And I went to the door and it was one of those uh, doors, like the wooden frame and the, the middle part of it is all glass. The lighting outside wasn't terrific, but I think there were blinds and I pulled the blinds back and I saw somebody, whoever it was, was wearing jeans. And I, for some reason, that suggested to me that it was my friend. And I opened the door and there was this man before me. And he said, is Mr. Charles Stewart in? And almost immediately, like the thoughts hit my brain, like this tsunami of what the heck, this guy it does not mean you well. This is dangerous he is dangerous. You need to close the door. And I think somewhere in there, I thought, I wonder if this is the guy that I saw last week. Isn't this the guy? I don't know I, I, if it was like an intuition or I, I don't know. I, I started to slam the door shut and he pushed his way in and I screamed very loudly. I screamed. I was banging on the door next to me. I was hoping that my friend in the apartment next to me would hear it, but he very quickly subdued me. I mean, he was very quick about it. I don't know if he had done this before, but if he hadn't, then he was a natural because it just like, I I, I couldn't even process what was going on. And then all of a sudden my scarf was tied around my mouth really tightly and my neck almost choking me. He had my arms pinned and he said, if you don't shut up, I will cut you. And I felt something like poking into my middle back. And I thought, that's a knife. He's got a knife and he will kill me. I decided just to try to be calm and sort of talk my way out of whatever was going on and maybe talk him down at the same time. But he was very worked up, very angry. I remember he went straight to my purse. I had like $5 in there. He grabbed that out of my, my wallet again. He stuffed that into his pants pocket and then he marched me, kind of frog marched me to the back of the apartment where there was one of the, the two bedrooms and it was completely empty. There was no furniture or anything in it, but he made me take off my pants and lie down on the, on the floor. And he began to sexually assault me. And he started by trying to perform oral sex on me. He wasn't, I don't know. I just, it, he, he seemed, the anger still seemed to be like the thing that was driving him the most. So I was a very, confused as to why he was doing this. For a minute, I was talking. I was like, you know, if you want money, I can get get you money. I know a friend. I was just trying to like come up with anything 
to get him off of me and get him out of the way so I could slam the door and be safe. But I wasn't thinking things through very clearly at the time because nothing he, I said would have made any difference to this man at all. You can't be expected to be thinking clearly at a time like this anyway. You really can't. I mean, the, the things that go through your head will kind of surprise you later on, you know. But I think the body and the mind both have a way of protecting you. And you've got like these coping mechanisms that help try to keep you safe, right? So I could tell from this, the way this guy was with me that if I fought back, I would get injured. So if I was going to fight back, I needed like the opportune moment, the perfect moment, and I needed to commit and then to do it quickly. And so that opportunity presented itself to me. And I was able to, while he was concentrating elsewhere, I was able to get the scarf out from around my neck and I had it in my hands. I remember thinking, I can wrap this around his neck. I can loop it around his neck and I can pull, but I will have to kill him. Like he's not going to stop unless I do that. And that thought made me hesitate. Like, can I really take a person's life? It just long enough, paused just long enough that he looked up and saw what I was doing. And I guess he figured what I was about to do. At which point, this man rammed his fist inside of me. And I, I cannot express to you enough how absolutely painful that is, just on a physical level, first of all. But then he's yelling at me, I will rip your womb out. I will rip your womb out over and over again. And I'm like, I believe you can do it. I believe you would do it. And I was trying to, through my tears and, and screams, I was trying to you know, reassure him that I wouldn't try anything. And I didn't. I just, I, I just wanted to survive it and get, get through with it at that point. And, and it didn't last much longer. After that, like he did try to rape me vaginally, and I thought that he wasn't successful because it didn't last long at all. The next thing I know, he's off of me. He's pulling up his pants and he says, you need to stay there and I will be watching, but don't come out. I think he's like for 10 minutes or something like that. And don't call anybody. And I thought, you idiot, if you think I'm not calling somebody after that. So a few minutes after he left, I heard nothing. So I got dressed and I sort of tentatively peeked out and I was looking for him. My front door was wide open and I, I just got my courage together and I ran. I ran out the door and I ran next door and I started banging on my friend's door uh, trying to get some help. And He finally opened it and he did, hadn't heard anything. Like The soundproofing on these apartments was top notch because he had not heard a thing. So I called 911 from his apartment and uh, he gave me some water and was trying to calm me down a little bit. I was completely, I was like vibrating with fear and, and just the adrenaline, I guess, was dissipating. But it was, it was such an odd experience, you know, not to be in control of your body, really. And it was painful. It was, I, I hurt like everywhere and I just wanted this to be over, but I knew I had to talk to the police. I never even questioned that. And they came in shining their very bright flashlights <laughs> and um, asking very you know, pointed questions. And, and I felt like they didn't believe me. I felt like they came to me from a perspective of disbelief. I found out later that's not the case. But their training at that time, I think, was so ridiculously centered in suspicion and proof that they treated sexual assault victims as if they were not telling the truth until they found proof that they were. It was very difficult. It was difficult to be around and to be subjected to that after having endured that kind of trauma. But they took me to the ER and I had to wait for hours to get a kit perform sexual assault evidence kit performed on me. Did the hospital have those kits? Did they keep those or did the police yes. give you those? They, I, I appreciate, yeah, I think the hospital, even back then, kept the kids on hand, but they have to have a police officer there to take custody of it immediately and work reserve chain of custody. So I was sitting there with you know, one detective or another. I think the detective left at one point and there was a uniform guy there. And I had to go to the bathroom so bad, finally, like around somewhere around midnight, I guess. I said, I, I just have to go. And 
the nurse kind of, I don't know if it was the nurse or the, the officers, one of them shrugged and said, well, yeah, you can go, but if you go, you might be getting rid of evidence. So, you know, your call. And I thought, oh, that this is ridiculous. Like, I have to go. I can't not go. <laughs> so, so I tried, I was as careful as I could be, you know, and, but I didn't think at that point that there was any evidence to gather because I didn't think that he had ejaculated uh, or finished the rape at all because it just seemed to me very quickly, abruptly ended, you know. So they finally came in after some time after midnight and they took that kit or did all the collection. And if you, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's just such an incredibly invasive procedure. Like they have to visually inspect the area. They perform a, like a pelvic exam. They they're looking for scrapes and contusions and all kinds of stuff. They're collecting samples, and they have you stand up, and they have to pull hairs out, out of your body, like off your head, your pubic hair. You know, they're collecting like ten hairs from each location. And it sounds like that would be even more pain on top of what you're already experiencing. It was absolutely so degrading. And even though I knew they had to do it and I knew I understood why they had to do it, it was just, oh, if there were any better way, this is just such a terrible thing to have to endure, especially after a sexual assault. But I don't know how else you would get that, that evidence. And in my case, it was a really good thing they did. The neighbor who was kind of come over and see me, the one I had been expecting, actually accompanied me to the ER. It was very sweet of her, and I really appreciate her to this day for her kindness. And she let me sleep on her couch. She had like a futon couch. She had a smaller like studio apartment. But I wasn't about to sleep in that room, in that place at all. So yeah, I went over and slept with her. And then the next day, my ex-boyfriend came and collected me and took me to a friend's house in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, just for the weekend so I could get away. I appreciated that concern. I appreciated that act of kindness, but it, just, it was not a good place for me to be because they'd also given me the sum the morning after pill to prevent pregnancy. And it was one of the side effects of that is just severe nausea. So I was sick to my stomach for pretty much the entire weekend. And then, you know, Monday came around and, and I went back to work and things started to sort of slowly regain some normalcy, except with this overlay of now I am, you know, the complaining victim in this sexual assault case and they have they're looking for the guy and he's out there somewhere and he knows where i live and he's apparently familiar with where i live so that was kind of terrifying did you consider moving i did but it didn't really make a whole lot of sense for me and that's because of what was going on in january that year the next year that was this was december so in january the company that i was a member of would split in two and there was a home company and a road company. And, and I was in the road company and we were going out on this national tour of a play for like six and seven year olds about Paddington Bear, of all things. So that was actually good. The, the play was like the best choice if I had to do this. But then I was out on the road for like five months until May. So it didn't make a whole lot of sense for me to move before then. You want to go ahead and talk about the, the piece of mail that showed up? so weird the night it happened the rapist when i opened the door he said is mr charles stewart in or is the charles stewart here or something like that about a week and a half two weeks later i went to the mailbox to get my mail and i had like one piece of like a bill or something and there were some other pieces directed to occupant or whatever but there was also an envelope an official looking one directed to my apartment number but addressed to mr charles stewart Every hair on the back of my neck went straight up. And I thought, oh, holy cow, this is significant. Like, I don't know how, but it has to be, right? So I called the police. I told the detective what I'd found. He sent over a uniformed person to collect the envelope, which happened very quickly. And I guess about a week before we left, I got a phone call back from that detective. And he said, I found him. And I said, you found who? He said, I found Charles Stewart. I thought, oh, yeah, because I'd almost forgotten, you know. He said, yeah, you're not going to believe it, but he's serving a 30-year prison sentence for rape in Virginia. That's way more than a coincidence. It's got to be. Like how this guy knew enough to know that that man, Charles Stewart, lived here. They're both apparently involved in the same criminal activities. That's bizarre. 
But yeah, that happened. And I thought, well, okay, at least that gives them something to pursue while I'm out on the road, I guess. Because I really didn't think there was much evidence. So you didn't really have a lot of hope that this was even going to be resolved? I don't know if I had any. After the first few weeks, I thought, you know, so I started thinking about like all of the, the, the obstacles that are in their way, like every little challenge to finding out who this person is. I mean, how would you know? How would you figure that out? You know, unless there were fingerprints on file, unless there was some kind of something. And of course, this was pre-DNA days. This was a couple of years before DNA became widely used in criminal investigations. I mean, I thought, well, okay, maybe they can get a blood type, but I don't think the guy ejaculated. So how would they even know that? You know, I felt very I won't say depressed about it then, but I later I was. But I just felt kind of resigned to it. You know, this was how it was going to be. And so I went home for Christmas for a couple of weeks, right before we went out on tour. Two days after Christmas, I realized that I was late on my period. And I my mother was just as sweet and supportive as she could possibly be. She bought me like Three, two or three different kinds of pregnancy tests, and all of them were, were positive. By the next day, we, she said, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, I can't have this baby. I can't bear my rapist child. I, I can't. And she said, absolutely, okay. By the end of that day, she'd arranged uh, an abortion for me, and we'd gone to the clinic. We you know, had to wait 24 hours, even back then. Of course, now I probably would not have, I probably would be denied an abortion given the state that we were in. But I was able to secure it and, and I was I have never regretted it, not one minute, not not one second since then. And that was the right decision. What I regret and what I resent is being put in that position. That should not have happened to me or anybody. Nobody should have to make that choice. But I did. I did. I made it. I, I'm glad that I did and it's the choice that I would support any woman making in that in that situation. So that was another little fun, not fun, awful thing. There's so many, so many consequences to this, and I was the one bearing them all. Like I kept thinking, when when is it his turn? When does he get to bear some of these consequences? And through the years, I thought, how would I know him? Like he could come up to me, and I'm that was the other thing. Like I didn't really, I couldn't pull up his face in my memory. I couldn't sit here and think, okay. I remember certain things about his appearance and I could physically or verbally describe him, but I, I could not pull up the face. And so about six months after the assault, I had moved back home with my mother and I was just sort of taking some time to collect myself. I was working in this retail job. I just wanted to be as low key as possible and focus on my own healing, whatever that meant. But one of the uniformed officers in Louisville called me while I was in my new home, several states away. And uh, he said, I've been working on this in my, in my spare time, and I think I know who raped you. And I would like to send a photo lineup to your local police department for you to look at. Are you okay with that? And I said, I'm happy to, but you should know. I, I don't know that I remember his face all that well. And he said, that's fine. Not a problem. You know, it, the person might be there, might not be there. Just do, do your best. Those officers brought the like six photos to my workplace, and I remember taking them into the back office because I didn't want to do this out in front of the customers, obviously. And I looked at them and I thought, I don't like. There's no emotional reaction to any of them. There's no, oh my gosh. There's no clenching in my gut. I don't. I don't think he's here. But I, if he is, I don't recognize him. So that just further reinforced in my mind that I don't recognize this person. I would not recognize him. And I said, I'm so sorry. I, I don't recognize them. And they took the photos and that was that. It was so strange because I, I remember kept, I kept thinking, you know, why am I not falling apart? Why am I not having more PTSD symptoms? It's, I seem okay. What is that about? Can I possibly really be that okay? And I thought, well, you know what? If I am okay, then I should help others. And if I'm not okay, then I should be around people who understand. And so to me, that meant our local rape crisis center. The fact that you recognized that you shouldn't be okay, that was really smart. 
What triggered that, do you think? I mean, for a lot of people, you would think, well, I guess it, it must not have been that bad because I don't feel like I'm traumatized like I would expect to be. But you knew that's that didn't make sense. There was a part of me, yeah. It was like a little small part of me that was sitting in observation of all this. And I think that's something that maybe possibly came from yoga. I don't know. I practiced yoga for many years. And one of the things that I think every teacher sort of said in some way or another was, you know, you don't have to react. You can step outside yourself and sort of observe what's going on. That was sort of the precursor to mindfulness, I guess. So I was thinking in terms of like, okay, what is going on? What, how am I feeling? Like observe that, record that, put, put words to that. But what I was observing was, you know, normal pulse rate. I don't seem to be overly fearful. I feel a little twitchy sometimes, like I've got like a little too much energy, but I don't know, that might just be me being, you know, in my mid twenties and in a, in a rocking party town. <laughs> And I thought, maybe that's what I need. I mean, I just need to go out and cut loose a little bit. And I, I tried that for a few months, but that didn't work. You worked as a volunteer as a rape crisis counselor. I did. Weirdly, I saw like a flyer somewhere. They were looking for volunteers. And I thought, okay, I'll give them a call. You know, I don't know if I'm what they're looking for, but maybe this will help me too. And in helping others, I can sort of recover my own from my own trauma. So I went through their training. It was like three days of several hours worth of workshops and, and um, practice consultations. And like we had to practice listening to each other non-reactively and you know, how to be supportive without feeding fear, how to talk to police officers because a lot of the officers were maybe not uh, the most attuned to a, a victim's suffering, let's say. Some of them were, were pretty much like I had thought those first officers responding to my rape had been or they come across as very suspicious and like you've got to prove to me that something happened to you which being a counselor like my role was completely different my role was i absolutely believe you i'm here to advocate and support you and i did that for a couple of years and i have to say that was one of the best things i could have done it was one of the hardest things i could do you get called at two in the morning to get to the local ER because a woman's been brought in by her roommate. And she's bleeding and crying hysterically. You can't tell anybody what happened, but everybody knows. That's difficult. You know, that, that will trigger all kinds of stuff if you're also a survivor. But for me, it also triggered like really deep empathy. And I was able to use that at least to stand beside these people and say, look, I've been where you are. I have been where you are. You can come through this. I'm here for you. What do you need right now? Because nobody else there is. Everybody else that, that a victim meets the night of a sexual assault wants something from her. My only focus was on her. Like, what do you need? And I found a real empowering spirit in that you know i felt a little bit like an avenging warrior <laughs> like like i was going to go not like i was going to go you know chop down whoever did it although it, some nights i probably could have quite easily but that i was there to protect a sister who had also been raped and they were usually sisters they were predominantly women although it's absolutely true that men can be sexually assaulted and, and we all went to like special training for that too so at this point a couple of years had gone by your your memory of his face was fading. You really had no information about him. And he seemed to have just disappeared. Yeah. I can imagine at that point you're thinking, well, that's it. There's nothing more can be done. That's exactly what happened. I just concluded that that was a part of my life that sucked, that probably did some damage, that I might see some the results of that damage later in my life, but I hadn't yet. But there was nothing else to be done. And so I sort of compartmentalized it and stuck it in a drawer and put it up on the shelf, so to speak. And I went on with life. I didn't think that it was affecting me. I see now that it was. I see now how it, how it affected me. But at the time, even self-awareness was not enough, or at least the amount that I had wasn't sufficient. <laughs> I look back now and I see it like almost immediately, like my world started to contract. 
I stopped going out. I stopped doing a lot of things. And somehow, by the time we got to like 2020, 2019, 2020, when the pandemic hit, how everybody had to learn to live that March, I'd been living like that for, for years. My groceries are delivered. I hardly go out anymore. I'm literally, I'm like a hermit, you know? And um, I, I do blame him and that and what happened to me. I blamed the rape and I blamed the rapist for making me feel like I can't leave my home. But it's not an agoraphobic thing. It's more like a there is nothing out there that interests me, <laughs> you know. I'm working on that now. I'm still I'm trying to overcome that now, but that's how it was for like 29 years. And that was not the end of the story. You were doing some research with the idea of writing a novel. So over this time period, this 29 years, you had gone into a career of writing. Is that what you were doing at that time? Yes. I trans transferred over to writing, um, or sorry, writing when I was, I guess, somewhere around 2008, 2009. And I began doing uh, online digital writing, like blogging, um, copywriting for websites, that kind of thing. And I was working on novels, but or a novel, but it just wasn't coming together. And I thought, I just need to put that aside and try something else. And I had seen a couple of books that had been turned into movies or TV shows that were based on the author's experiences, like fictionalized accounts. They call it autofiction when it's written. And I thought, I, you know, I could probably do something like that. Maybe that might suit my experiences in theater and in Louisville. So, yeah, I started researching that. And almost immediately it occurred to me, why have I not searched for people who have been raped with the same circumstances or the same MO? I thought I can search for the, the area for Louisville and I could search for late 80s, early 90s. And I think he's done this before, and I, he probably did it again after. So there's probably others out there like that who were also hurt by him. And maybe we could, I don't know, compare notes and maybe come up with something that the police haven't thought of. So I did this very simple Google search, and it was, I think it was something for like serial rapist, 1990s Louisville, Kentucky. The first result for me back then was a picture in a news article about a man who was pleaded guilty to several counts of rape. And one of the survivors was telling the story of her assault. And there were a few things in there that were really similar to my assault, like the way he was so angry and the fact that he had her take off her pants and lie down on the ground. And I thought, this could be him. And I thought, I don't know what to do with this. So I went to my Facebook page <laughs> and I asked all my friends on Facebook, you know, like, I think this is, I think I found my rapist. What do I do? And everyone was like, you've got to call. You've got to call the police department because they need to know this. And that is him. And if it's not, then maybe it will help them find the person who did this to you. And I thought, well, that's never going to happen. But okay, fine. So the next day, I called the Louisville Metro Police Department, and I was directed to a wonderful, wonderful detective. And he was trained in trauma-informed detective skills, like investigative skills that took into account the victim's trauma. I told him what I had found, and I said, I don't know that you can do anything. I don't even know what you could do, but you know, here's the information I found. And he says, okay. And he said, okay, Annie, I need to know, what do you want to happen with this? What's your ideal outcome? And nobody had ever asked me that. Like, just like all those victims that I had served before when I was a, a crisis counselor, everybody wanted something from me, but nobody ever asked me, what do you want to have happen? Well, except my mom during the, uh, right before the abortion, she asked me, but nobody else. And I thought, wow, I've waited 29 years to hear that. <laughs> from a police officer. So I told him, I'd like to I'd know who did it. I'd like to know a name. I would love for him to be put in jail. But if I can't have that, then at least I'd like to know that he exists. and I'd like to know his name. And I'd really like to know who Charles Stewart is. And I'd like to know why he picked me. And, 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 you know. Well, he, he asked, right? He asked, <laughs> right? And he said, okay. He goes, I think I can probably help you with some of that. I don't know if I can help you with all of it, but I will do whatever I can. 
He was absolutely 100% true to his word. He went above and beyond to help me out. He immediately pulled the file. And the, when he pulled the written file, he was calling me like daily to update me on what he had found, which I really, truly appreciated because I had never before really been kept in the loop at all. And what he told me would just astonish me because these detectives, the original round, had not ignored me. They had believed me. They did believe me. They did try their best to find this guy. They had 12 suspects identified at one point, and they ruled them out with DNA. And that was the first time, July 2019, that was the first time I learned that he had left behind DNA. They had samples. I thought, that's, that's amazing. That is, that's huge, <laughs> you know? But they had ruled out all the other guys, so none of the ones that were in that original photo lineup that I looked at earlier, all of them had been ruled out. So we're basically starting from square one with a bunch of people ruled out and a few leads, but and then this DNA, which you know would be great if we could find somebody and match it to you. So to get it into CODIS, which did not exist at the time that I was raped, it came around a few years after that. Is that like the DNA database? That is the combined offender DNA something. Yeah. I can't remember the rest of it. Yes. That is that is what yeah, that's what most law enforcement agencies now have access to. So they could put in a DNA profile and see if that person has been apprehended or, you know, incarcerated before, if they've given any kind of DNA sample that would be in the system, or if their DNA was collected at a different crime scene. So kind of kind of like a, a twenty-three and me for bad guys. Exactly. Exactly only for yeah, exactly. And then so I thought, all right, well, let's, you know, we'll see. And he's like, it's going to take like two to three months. And I said, that's fine. I waited 29 years. I can wait a couple of months. So he went and he found my kit in this huge, huge warehouse. And the warehouse had moved, like, like all, the, all the, the databases, all the kits had been moved physically in the intervening years. So I thought the fact that they still have my kit and my file is nothing short of amazing to me. The fact that he could find it was incredible. And he looked inside and he goes, there's a couple of pieces of evidence here that have not been tested yet. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? And he's like, well, if, if we can find DNA on these pieces of evidence, then we have a clean sample we can put into, D, into CODIS and find, see if he's been entered in there before, see if we know who he is. And I thought, oh, okay. And like all of a sudden, like after 29 years of nothing, things were moving so fast. All of this took place in just a couple of weeks, really. But were you thinking at the at the time, This it sounds like this is really good, but I don't want to get my hopes up. Oh, gosh, absolutely, yes. I never thought, even at that point, I really did not think the detective would be able to finally resolve this or solve, solve the case. I really did not think that was going to happen. Because I thought if, if it were going to happen, then it would have already happened. You know, he's had 30 years to commit crimes and be arrested. And if he's not already in there, then, well, it turns out he was. Sometime in, I think it was August, the detective called me and said, they found DNA on the evidence that I submitted, the new evidence that has not been tested yet. They found DNA profile. It's not yours. It's male. We're going to enter that into CODIS and see. And a couple of months after that, he called me back and said, we got him. We know who he is. And the kicker is if i had done this a year before he would not have been in there he would not have been in the codis database it was a it was an assault that he committed and pleaded guilty to and part of his plea was he had to submit his dna and that was done a year before i called and that's the only reason that they could find him and so they found him and he had a name i didn't know the name i didn't get any of that information and the detective said, well, my, my job now is to go make contact with him. And I just want to get him to commit to a couple of facts and get, be put on record as saying this. And that way I can, I can use that information against him later if it plays out the way I think it's going to. So he found a couple of photos of me at, at, that, at my younger age. And he went to this person's apartment. And he asked him, he said to me very clearly, yeah, what here, it's what I'm here for. I guess he took like kind of this 
sort of self-deprecating, uh, you know, I've got to follow these things up, you know how it is, I don't really expect anything, and I don't know that I necessarily believe anything happened, but, you know. Just a formality. Just a formality. It's like, so, so have you met her? Do you know her? And he said, no, I've never seen her before in my life. I've never met her. And he said, okay, so you haven't been in her apartment, and he gave the, the address. And and he kind of paused, he went back, he goes, no, no I don't remember ever being in that apartment. He kind of stuttered a little bit, I guess. But he was very clear, you know, not him. He didn't do it. Won him. So the detective said, all right, well, you know, would you be willing to do a DNA test just to, you know, rule yourself out? And he's kind of pulled back. He goes, I'd have to talk to a lawyer about that or something like that. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I trust the DNA. I'm not sure I would trust, like, my perception of it, but I trust the DNA. I trust the science. And so the next thing the detective wanted me to do was another photo lineup. So he sent the six photos to my local police department. And on December 6, 2019, I went to see if I could identify any of them. This was the second experience I'd had with a photo lineup. And the first one was not good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, right. You didn't even remember the face then, right? No, I, and it was just such a hit to my self-esteem, too, you know, that I couldn't figure out. I, I didn't know who this was or recognize him. But the reason I couldn't recognize him is he wasn't in it. Because as soon as this detective, she laid out the photos in front of me, and she was going over like, okay, here's what I want you to do, and you know, pick one, and initially, I'll, my eyes just went immediately to this one picture. And I, I just said, that, that's him. That's him. And I was so sure. Like my body, everything in my body reacted like, that's him. That is him. And my hands were shaking. And I looked up at her and she said, honey, are you okay? Do you need a tissue? And that was the moment where I realized I was crying. Like I didn't know I was crying. But there were tears coming out of my eyes looking at this man who attacked me. And I knew that was him. I recognized it. That was a very, very big moment for me. You saw you were looking at a picture of him having aged thirty years, also, right? Or was it a younger picture of him? He was. It was. He was slightly younger, but he was older than he had been at the time. Yeah, but everybody. Yeah, everybody in the photo lineup looked about the same age, like forty to sixty, somewhere in that range. So I identified the person. I, you know, wrote down my name, my initial, and I did all that stuff. She sent it off to uh, the detective in Louisville. And I went back home and just waited. And I thought, I, and then I started like second guessing myself again. <laughs> like, oh, maybe I didn't. Maybe I was wrong. I don't know. But I got a phone call from the detective that afternoon. And he said, you did it. That's him. That's the guy. And I said, okay, wh- what now? <laughs> and he goes, well, tomorrow, she said, tomorrow is the 29th anniversary, isn't it? And I said, yeah, yeah, it is, December 7th. And he said, like, I'm going to give you an early Christmas present. I'm going to go arrest this guy. And he did. <laughs> he did. Everybody listening right now is saying, yes. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. I mean, he was, I, I don't, he was very... He downplayed it a lot when he was telling me the story. But what I heard was he was in there with like his boss and like a captain or something. And they were they were in the car and they were staking the guy out. I mean, it was literally like Law and Order Louisville SVU. And he went. His brother came and drove up behind or into the into the car into the driveway or whatever. But the the brother saw the detective's car and noted that it was the detective. He's like, I I know he knew who I was. So I thought, I'm going to have to go. I have to go now. I cannot wait for this. So when his brother pulled back in, Roscoe literally ran, the guy, the rapist, ran down the stairs to get into his brother's car, I guess. And uh, the detective sort of hopped over <laughs> the end of the car. I imagine it was like one of those slide on the trunk moves, you know, like Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> or it might not have been, but in my head, that's what it was. And he's like, hey, you going anywhere? <laughs> And the guy said, "Oh, I'm going out of town to see my to see my daughter." And he goes, "No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Just step out of the car, please." So he he arrested him, and they did a second DNA test, and it matched the evidence again completely. So he was charged and uh, arraigned. He was given a bail of 
God bless Kentucky, $250,000. And that kept him in jail until his case was disposed of in 2022. So he was in jail that for how long before the trial started? Uh, well, from December 7th, 2019 until October something, 2022, like the first week of October. So almost three years then. Which is why, yeah, he did. He eventually did plead down, um, accepted a plea deal, and it was for not a terribly long sentence. But he had already been in jail for three years too. So I thought, you know what, I'm okay with this. I just want this over. Through the attorney, I was the victim's advocate. I guess I, I said I would like to do a plea deal. I'm happy to do a plea deal, but I want him to sit down with me and I want him to answer these questions that I have. And they posed that to him, although they were not in favor of it, like none of them were really, but they said, okay, we'll ask. And his response was, how can I, how can I admit to something that I don't remember doing? And the wording of that just struck me. Not, I can't, t- I can't talk about something I didn't do, but something I don't remember doing. And I thought, I don't believe you. I think you do remember it. I think you don't want to, but I think you do remember it. He had a very long rap sheet, none of which were so- sexual assaults, as far as I know. So mine seems to have been an anomaly in his career. But he was he was a criminal. He he had a long, lengthy history with law enforcement. Or else he had sexual assaults and just never got caught for them. That's entirely possible. You know, there could be a lot of things out there that he never got identified. And I don't know if there's DNA in those other cases or not, if they even exist. But hopefully now that he's in there and he has this charge on this record, if there are, then maybe they can find them. He had to be thinking after 29 years, I'm free. I got away with one. You've got to think that he would. I mean, that is a long time. And then you think you're you're scot-free and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this this Louisville detective comes up and says, hey, by the way. Remember this moment? So he is, he's currently in prison, right? He is. Yes. He pleaded guilty to uh, second degree rape, sodomy, and burglary. And he was sentenced to six years or so, and, and three of its time served. So, yeah, I mean, he could get out as early as next year, but I am firmly connected to Kentucky's victims' notification system. I will get a phone call, I will get an email. If anything changes with respect to his incarceration or, or release date, but I also go and check the website like every couple of weeks just to be sure. And the other thing too is he's going to turn seventy six years old later this year. Yep. Yep. Did you ever get any answers about why he targeted you? Have you tried to contact him at all? I have not tried to contact him. I asked if the detective, and I asked also if the victim's advocate. I think if if I could pose those questions. And the answer that we got back every time was, I don't remember. I don't remember doing it. And in fact, he even tried to assert that at the plea hearing, I'm pretty sure. I was listening in, I was participating via phone, and the the judge gave me time to make my statement. I read a statement of impact, and I got to the end of it, and I was shaking. I was just like, I can't believe this is over. And I I, I was sort of Again, filled with that adrenaline dump and try to process all that. But I heard him start to speak over the judge. The next thing I heard was his, I heard him say something like, but I, but I, and and, and his lawyer just said, shh, shh. I literally heard him hush him. And the, the heard, I definitely heard the judge say, Mr. Smith, I would strongly advise you not to say another word right now. And he didn't. I mean, he, he he took the he took the hint, and he he was silent from that point on. But I would love to know. I'd love to know. I, did he just see me while he was like prowling around looking for his old friend? Yeah, was it a crime of opportunity that turned into a target? Yeah, I don't know. Probably, I think that's probably the case. But I knew it was him. And here's the other thing that was very reassuring to me. Because when this happens to you and it's a stranger and you have to recount all of these details, you feel this incredible pressure to be accurate and not to get anything wrong, not to claim knowledge of something that isn't right, you know? 
or at least I did, but I knew, I knew certain facts and I was trying to communicate those facts. And I remember saying very clearly, he's six foot three, he's six foot three. And they were like, how do you know he's six foot three? And I said, because last week, my friend from Chicago drove down to see me and he spent the weekend with me and he is six foot three. And I know what he feels like standing next to me. I know where his head comes. I know where my head comes to him. And this was exactly that. And I was very insistent on that. And I found out through you know, the reopening of the case that, yeah, like everybody who saw it, there were like three other people who saw him that night who described him the, the same way. I didn't even know that the other eyewitnesses existed, but they saw him and they all said, yeah, he's very tall, like around 6'3", six, 6'5", six, somewhere around there. And in fact, he was. He was 6'3", exactly. He's going to be eligible for release in the next year or two. Do you have a plan of action for when he gets out? I mean, you're several states away, so that's that's a good thing. It is. But what have, what have you thought about when that happens? I mean, I realistically, I don't think that he has the resources to come after me. If he does, I will. I mean, that's a good that's a good question. I've got s- certain things that I do for my protection that I've always done since this happened, and that will maybe I'll beef that up a little bit. But I will be prepared. Better believe it. And and if it happens again, I'm not going to hesitate this time. He should know that. What's your incentive for wanting to get this story out to people? Well, there's a couple of things. One is that sexual assault is such a common experience, especially for women. And I want other women to know they're not alone, that if this happens to them, they can survive it and they can come through the other side with some kind of justice. I want them to know that, first of all. Second, and maybe even, might even be more important, uh, there are so many rape kits out there in police warehouses all across this country. Some of them may not even be viable anymore because they haven't been preserved well. But the ones that are there need to be tested. Every single kit needs to be looked at and needs to be tested. Like in my case, he would never have been found if the detective hadn't gone and physically pulled the kit and found two pieces of clothing that had not been tested and sent those into the state lab in Kentucky for, for testing. It, it, this would not, we would not be here. I wouldn't be talking to you today. And that's only because you called. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's true too. I mean, you've got to call and you've got to be a little in your face about it sometimes. And I would wish that everybody would get an astonishingly caring and competent detective like I did. You're not. A lot of them aren't. Probably most. And that's unfortunate. But, you know, okay, whatever. Do what you can with what you've got. And finally, I guess to police departments everywhere, I would say y'all need to start training your detectives in trauma-informed techniques for investigation and for handling witness interviews because that made all the difference to me. Putting He made me feel like I was, if not driving the train, then at least, you know, in the area. I was being consulted. And that is so empowering and helpful. And it's really crucial. It's been crucial to my healing, to be honest with you. Rape is a, is a crime of, it's not a crime of sex. It's about power and control. And for as long as the, you're in your, your rapist's presence, you don't have that control. It's something that we all take for granted, right? Like, I can move my body. I can get away from you. I can say, not now. You can't be in my space. But what if you can't? And you are subjected to somebody else's vile, cruel impulses. Well, you've lost control for that little bit of time. And the only way to heal, and I believe this firmly, is to get it back, is to be in control, to be given the authority to be in control of your of your case to say you know I want you to to go after this guy I want to pursue this what do you need from me you know but that takes a lot of guts sometimes it really does you had a lot of guts you did it I 
you know, I don't know if I did or if I just moved so fast that I, I sort of didn't realize that I didn't, <laughs> but either way it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there should be for, for detectives that get a cold case like this resolved, they should get a bonus or something. I absolutely 1000% agree. This guy took a 30 year old case and ran with it and nailed it shut within like four months. And he did it on the anniversary of the crime. I can't tell you how meaningful that was to me. Like he gave me back that day. The next, like three years later, after Smith had pleaded guilty, I remember posting on Facebook, wow, for the first time in like 30 plus years, today is only Pearl Harbor Day. That's all it is. And I mean, that's a big day, obviously, but it's not like what it was for me. It wasn't like my personal, you know, Armageddon day. So that was a huge gift that he gave me and I really appreciated it. I think Annie is pretty amazing. You know, it takes a lot of courage to talk about the details of the trauma that she went through, but she wants other victims to know that they're not alone. If you're in a situation where you're being abused sexually, help is available. You can contact RAIN, that's R-A-I-N-N, which stands for the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. You can call their hotline any day, any time, That number is 800-656-4673. You can also chat with them directly on their website, which is rainn.org. I'll have that information in the episode notes. Also in the episode notes, you can get Annie's full victim impact statement that she read as part of the sentencing process. And you can see pictures of Annie. The episode notes are at whatwasthatlike.com slash 171. A few episodes back, my guest was Julie, who talked about what it was like to be a hospice nurse. That prompted Heather to send in this voicemail. Hi, Scott. I'm Minnie with Heather, and I was just listening to your podcast about Julie, the hospice nurse. And I have a little uh, story for you from when my mother passed away back in 1992. She was in a palliative care hospital receiving hospice care, I guess you could say. So we had, there were uh, four siblings. Um, We had all been called in uh, because she was supposed to pass away that evening. She was exhibiting symptoms. She had been kind of in in an unresponsive state for a few days, maybe four or five days. Before that, she was exhibiting strange behaviors, like eating things that weren't really there and that kind of thing. They called us all in and they said, you might want to come in tonight because this could be her last night. So we all went down and we sat there for several hours. And then the nurse came in and checked her and she said, well, she seems to have rallied. So it's not going to be this evening. So you might as well go home. So we all went home. And the next day I went in. And I came around the corner and my mother was sitting up in bed talking to her friend, Mary. And I was so stunned, I couldn't even talk. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, hi, Heather. Um, Can you do me a favor and go get Mary a coffee down the hall? Uh, There was a little kitchenette down there. And so I said, yeah, sure. Um, Mary, can I see you out in the hall? So Mary came out and I told her what had happened the night before. And she said, Oh, she seems fine to me. She was sleeping when I got here, but then, you know, she woke up and we've been having a conversation. She'd been there for like half an hour. And so I just was so stunned. So I went down to the kitchenette. There was a nurse sitting in there doing some paperwork. I turned on the kettle and whatever, and she said, strange how that happens, isn't it? And I said, oh, you know what's going on down there? And she said, oh, yeah, I see it all the time. And I said, oh, yeah, it's it's bizarre. Like, we were just here last night because she was supposed to die, and now she's sitting up in bed like I don't get it. And she said, um, is she really close to that woman? And I said, oh, yes, they've been friends for many years. They're very good friends. And she said, well, was she away somewhere? And I said, yes, actually, she was over in Holland visiting family. And she said, well, I bet you she said, I'll see you when, you get, when I get back from my trip. So my mother was just holding on, waiting for her to come. So the next day when I went in, my mother was back unresponsive. The next day, I think it was, I went in and she had the death rattle. She was dying of, um, she had lung cancer and then it turned to metastasized to brain cancer. And so 
I was sitting there and I was only 23 years old and my father had passed away when I was 17. So this was my last parent. And so I was sitting in the room with her and she kept, you know, she would breathe and then it would be really shallow. And then I'd look and I'd wonder if she had passed and she didn't pass and then she'd gasp. And it was really, really uh, terrifying, actually. And I was afraid of death. I'd always been afraid of death, but I didn't want her to die alone. So anyways, I went down to the kitchenette to see if there was anybody there that could come and sit with me. And there was a nurse in there and she said, oh, I'm really sorry. We're a little short staffed today. And I said, oh, okay. So I went back into my mom's room and next thing the nurse comes in and she's got my mom's little table thing. She had propped that, set that up so that she could do her paperwork. So I wouldn't have to be alone. So that was very nice. So I sat there all day, literally from probably six in the morning, sat there all day. And then my sister-in-law and my brother came in right after uh, they were finished work. So probably about five o'clock. And I was a smoker, but I didn't smoke all day because I didn't want to leave my mother alone. So uh, as soon as they came in, I got up and I went into the smoking room again. This is a long time ago. So yes, there was still a smoking room in the hospital. And so I went in and I just sat down and lit my cigarette and my sister-in-law came running in and she said, Heather, your mother passed away. And I was so angry that she had done that. I sat there all day long against my wishes, I guess you could say. I didn't want her to be alone, but I didn't want to see her die either. It was kind of a very torn experience for me. Anyways, I was very upset about that. And then one of the nurses was in the smoking room talking to one of the patients. And she came up to me because I was beside myself. I was very, very upset, crying and, you know, crying because she had passed away, but crying because she purposely waited till I was out of the room. That's how it seemed to me. So she said, well, you know, you're the baby and she probably knew that you didn't really want to be there and you were just doing it for her. So as soon as she felt there was somebody in the room with her that could handle her passing away, she passed. So just listening to Julie's stories brought back a lot of memories for me. So I thought I would call and share them with you. I love your podcast. I've called in a couple other times. Anyways, take care and keep up the great work and interesting stories. And if you'd like to listen to Julie talking about her hospice work, that's episode 168, titled Julie is a Hospice Nurse. I always welcome any comments or questions about any episode. If you have something to say, you can record it and send it to me like Heather did, or you can come over to the Facebook group and join over 6,000 other listeners for some super interesting discussions. And you can answer our new question every Tuesday. That's at whatwasthatlike.com slash Facebook. Graphics for this episode were created by Bob Bretz. Full episode transcription was created by James Lai. And here we are at this week's listener story. You know who sent this in? A listener, just like you. And we want to hear your story. Just something interesting that happened to you that you can tell in about 5 to 10 minutes. Record it on your phone and email it to me, scott at whatwasthatlike.com. This story is about a boss who had something important to say. Stay safe. I'll see you next time. This happened in the summer of 1982. It was a summer job between high school graduation and college. I got a job with a group of other kids who were in my high school, about five of them, at a country club. And what our job was, uh, we were basically a mixture of janitors and laundry people. Where we worked was not air conditioned, it was really hot, and the laundry place, you know, with dryers, no ventilation, got extremely hot. Someone even passed out. And we had to wear these coarse sort of uniforms it was a little uncomfortable. But that was fine. Now I have to tell a little background. I worked at a Jewish country club because I'm Jewish and because the other two country clubs in my town were restricted. There were no Jews allowed, no people of color. Our boss was this 
older German woman in her mid to late 70s. And she was very sprightly and very stern. She was had very high standards and I really wanted to please her. And I'm pretty much the only one who went above and beyond. And she really liked me because I was a good worker. So this group of high school students, all of them made fun of me because I was like the teacher's pet. You know, we kind of like jokingly said, oh, yeah, she was probably a Nazi. Ha 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 ha. And little by little, she'd invite me a little bit each day, like to come into her air conditioned office and she would serve me cake. And start to tell me about her life before and during and after World War II in Germany. Over the course of a couple of weeks, I heard more bits of the story that she wanted to tell me. Basically, what I remember is that she had such a great marriage. She met her husband before the war. He was, I believe, a mechanic. And he joined the Nazi party because his boss made him do that. And he was just went along. And she said that, you know, as things kind of got worked up in Germany, people saw something in Hitler because things had been so bad before. Her husband was drafted and went to war. The war ended, and that's when the whole concentration camp stuff came out. And at this point, she got very emotional. I mean, there was some crying, and she said, you know, we didn't know, we didn't realize, nobody knew. I was 17, and I didn't know how to process it, so I was like, well, I'm in air conditioning, and I've got cake. That's good. And she told me what happened to her husband. He was captured by the Soviets, ended up in a gulag, eventually sent back home. By the time he returned, he was so emaciated. His health was so bad. He had been tortured. I think he had broken bones. They didn't heal well. He was just in really bad shape. And he died soon after. She was bawling. I didn't really know what to make of it. So I just listened. And I suppose she was confessing to me like I was a surrogate Jew. I was going to forgive her. Other kids I worked with weren't Jewish. So I, I, she picked me to confess to, I suppose. So the summer ended. I went off to college. And I thought maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll write something about it. You know, I thought maybe I could make some meaning about it, but I didn't. I just went on with my life. And that was my summer job before college.